Okay, we ended part one with uh, the introduction to movement into and out of the cell. We looked at the cell membrane and its structure. Now let's talk about those processes. The passive process, it requires no energy. It's also called a physical process. It happens in the physical world as well as in the living world. It's simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. Active transport or physiological processes that don't occur normally in the physical world. It requires cellular energy. Active transport is one. Endocytosis, exocytosis, and transcytosis are all different types of active transport. Now let's look at passive transport first. So you have that phospholipid bilayer and you have small nonpolar molecules and so you have an area of high concentration of these nonpolar molecules in this extracellular fluid. And these nonpolar molecules are permeable to the membrane. So these molecules are moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration across a concentration gradient. A down a concentration gradient by simple diffusion until eventually they're going to be uh, if we counted the number of molecules on both sides, it'd be pretty close to equal. Now here's something that happens in nature all the time. Things are always in motion. So you may have some uh, of these molecules, these nonpolar molecules, moving back and forth through the membrane, even when you are at equilibrium. Diffusion is a physical non-living process that requires no energy. No ATPs are used. It's movement down a concentration gradient from areas of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. It's direct movement through a plasma membrane. So the molecules that move through this membrane, remember it's selectively permeable, must be nonpolar, lipid soluble, and very small. The rate of diffusion is affected by distance, the concentration of the substance, the molecular weight of the diffusing molecules. We've seen this before when we were talking about the movement of molecules in chemistry. An example would be hemodialysis. The concentration of glucose in dialysis fluid is lower than blood glucose levels. So what will happen? You have diffusion of the glucose from the blood to the fluid because, okay, look, it says the glucose in the dialysis fluid is lower than the blood glucose level. So one of the purposes of dialysis is one of the things, of course, it filters the blood, but one of the things it's removing is blood glucose. So in the fluid, there's lower a concentration of glucose, so the glucose moves from the blood to the fluid to help filter that extra glucose from the blood because that glucose is a solute that is moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration in the dialysis fluid. So uh, remember there is no energy, no ATP is used. It's down a concentration gradient. Direct movement through the plasma membrane. Molecules must be nonpolar, lipid soluble, and very small. It is not influenced by ATP or energy. It is a physical non-living process that, re that requires no ATP or energy. The rate of diffusion, we just talked about it, distance traveled, concentration of a substance, molecular weight of the diffusing molecules. With facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport, it is still passive, no energy, ATP are used, transmembrane carrier proteins usually move something too large 
or th something that's not lipid soluble. It's very selective. It's important that it's still moving down a concentration gradient. So substance crossing the membrane takes place with the help of proteins such as channel proteins, carrier proteins. Channel proteins are less selective than carrier proteins and usually mildly, mildly discriminate between their cargo based on size and charge, that bioelectrical charge, whether they're positive or negatively charged like those water molecules. Carrier proteins are more selective often only allowing one particle type of molecule to cross at a time. Glucose is transported into the cell this way because glucose is not um, permeable to the membrane. Molecules dissolved in a solution are in constant random motion due to their kinetic energy. One result of this motion is that dissolved molecules become evenly distributed throughout the cell. This tendency of molecules to spread out is an example of diffusion. But how do these molecules come to be evenly distributed? Let's start with a beaker of plain water. What will happen if we now add a lump of sugar to the water? A lump of sugar is composed of many individual sugar molecules. And even as a solid lump, the individual sugar molecules are in motion. When the lump is dropped into the water, it begins to dissolve. Individual sugar molecules move randomly and constantly from the area where they are common to the area where they are scarce. This type of motion, when molecules move from areas of their higher concentration to areas of their lower concentration, is called diffusion. Diffusion continues until all the sugar molecules become evenly dispersed throughout the beaker. The rate of diffusion is affected by temperature, size of molecules, and the steepness of the concentration gradient. Although not specifically shown in this animation, this is one of the processes whereby materials are exchanged between a cell and its environment. Now, the narrator did comment that temperature makes a difference. And we know this when we go to the restaurant and we have cold tea and uh, we add, add sugar to it. It takes a while and a lot of stirring for the sugar to dissolve. And you put more sugar and you may usually you have a little bit of sugar left in the bottom of the glass that doesn't dissolve because of the temperature of the tea. But if we have a hot cup of tea, we can add the same amount of sugar and all of it dissolves very quickly and that evenly distributes that sugar throughout that um, tea or and water, mainly water, and so temperature makes a difference. Now let's talk about solutions. That um, beaker with the sugar cube is a solution, okay, and that tea with the sugar is a solution. So let's talk about what a solution is. A solution is a solvent plus a solute is a solution. Now remember that arrow points to the product. So these are the reactants and this is the product. But uh, okay, so what's a solvent? In our body, our universal solvent is water. But you've heard of solvents before. It can it can be like paint paint thinner when you're cleaning your brushes after you've used oil-based paint. That is a solvent that helps to break apart the the paint. Okay, so the universal solvent in our body is water. And solute would be particles dissolved in that solvent to form the solution. The, sol the solute can be sugar, salt, proteins, other uh, potassium, calcium, other ions in suspension. And that in the solvent, the solvent plus a solute is solution. Okay, so uh, here we have two beakers. 
and actually it's the same beaker but we have a membrane here okay a semi-permeable membrane and these are particles dissolved in water now osmosis is a type of diffusion but there's two things different in the definition our definition of diffusion was the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration across a concentration gradient now osmosis is the diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane down a concentration gradient. In other words, it is the diffusion of water from an, through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. If the membrane is permeable to water through though not to the solute the water will equalize its own concentration by diffusing to the side of the lower water concentration and thus the side of the higher solute concentration okay let's look at this and that's what they're demonstrating here we have water and these molecules suspended in it now this permeable membrane is permeable to water now let's look at what we have here here we have water and just a few of the solute molecules here and then on this side we have water with many solute molecules now look at those solute molecules we have an even level of water here and we have all these solute molecules these solute molecules are taking up space that would normally be occupied by water molecules. So, because there's more solute on this side, there's less water. Since there's less solute on this side, there's more water molecules. So what's the definition? Diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So which way will the, mo the water move? Now in this example, the membrane is not soluble to or selectively permeable to these molecules. So they don't move. Only the water is moving. So here we see the water is moving from an area of, of more concentrated to less concentrated so it actually changes the level of water here until it equalizes why because this is taking up space where you'd have water molecules okay and um, i tell my class that um, if you will just remember that solute sucks Wherever the solute concentration is higher, it is going to draw the water toward it. Now, uh, in this beaker, the beaker on the left, the solution on the right side of the membrane is hypertonic. Okay, when we say hypertonic, we're talking about tonicity of the cell, and it's all about osmotic pressure. So the definition of tonicity is the ability of a solution to change tone or shape of the cells by altering internal water volume. I'm going to repeat that. Tonicity is the ability of a solution to change tone or shape of the cells by altering the e internal water volume. Okay, I want you to look at the shape of these red blood cells. By the way, these are red blood cells. And th the red blood cell is biconcave. It means that it has a dip in the middle, rounded at the ends, but on both sides. It's almost like having a donut without the hole punched all the way through but it has this depression on both sides this shape of this red blood cell gives it its ability to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide okay so there is a protein in this shape that is called hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin 
carries oxygen and then another type of hemoglobin that carries carb carbon dioxide. And so moving oxygen and carbon dioxide around in our body is very important. So the shape of this cell is conducive to the transport of those two important things. And if you change the shape of the cell, it uh, that hemoglobin on there no longer behaves the way it should so it does it loses the ability to carry the oxygen oxygen and the carbon dioxide that's why the shape of the cell is so important so if you have a person who has like sickle cell anemia they they the um, cells are sickled shaped so they're pointed on the end they're misshaped the hemoglobin is misshaped so it's unable to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide away oxygen to the tissues that it needs and also if it's pointed on both ends it uh, it's painful and it would clot very easily and stick to the inside of the vessels so it's pretty serious stuff okay so the shape of the cell is very important okay concentration of solutions now these cells are suspended in a solution okay remember this definition of a solution you are going to have a solvent and a solute and that is the solution so in a hypertonic solution what does that mean it has solute concentration higher than in another solution or higher than inside of the red blood cell so the concentration okay in red blood cells let's use salt as an example because inside red blood cells you have 0.9 percent sodium chloride salt inside this red blood cell 0.9 percent so say we have three percent salt solution here that these cells are suspended in okay hypertonic means that the solute is in higher concentration hyper higher concentration in the solution than in the cell okay so we looked at the definition of osmosis and we talked about that if you have a higher concentration of solute outside of that cell, then you'll have a lower concentration of water. Because that solute, in this instance salt, is taking up space the water molecules would take up. So here we have 3% sodium chloride and in here we have 0.9%. So where is the water going to move? It's going to move outside of the cell. And what happens here is that the cell will crenate, sort of collapse on itself. It, If we were looking at a cell, these cells under the microscope, it'd look like little star shapes that have little points on them because they've collapsed on their cell. That is called crenation when the cells collapse like this their 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 appearance is crenated remember that term crenation okay now in the isotonic it is equal on both sides so the solution that these blood cells are in is 0.9 percent sodium chloride and inside the cell 0.9 percent uh, sodium chloride so there is going to be exchange here like i said a few minutes ago you always have movement of molecules and so there is going to be a little bit of exchange but it's going to be equal on both sides so you may have some water moving in water moving out but it's going to be equal so the isotonic solution has a solute concentration equal to inside of the cell here okay now hypo hypotonic solution has a solute concentration lower than the other now what about that uh, in the old days when nurses had to prepare the uh, the uh, IV solution before they hung that bag and say that nurse hung a bag of distilled water 
Now distilled water does not have any solutes in it. Okay, zero solutes. And then this cell has 0.9% sodium chloride in it. Okay, so wait a minute, 0.9% is not very much. It's almost 1%, 0.9%. But there are sodium ions inside the cell, solute inside that cell, but none out here. So the water is always going to move toward the solute because the solute is taking up space that you would have water. So that would mean that there's less water inside that cell than there is outside the cell. So the water will move into the cell and that cell will swell and swell until, look here, you have cytosite is cell to lice is to break apart. So the breaking apart of the cell is cytolysis. Now, these are blood cells. So when we're talking about blood cells, we use the term, especially red blood cells, heme. So in this case, hemolysis is the breaking apart of blood cells. Okay, hemolysis will happen when in a hypotonic, if cells are placed in a hypotonic solution, that would be like hanging an IV of, of um, DI water or, or distilled water. Filtration. Filtration has the smaller molecules are forced through the porous membranes now the action of filtration, this is still passive, okay? It does not require cellular energy. It does not require ATPs. Hydrostatic pressure is important in the body. Hydrostatic blood pressure is hydrostatic pressure. And molecules leaving the blood vessels is an example. So because of blood pressure, there is a force Moving that blood through the vessel, that's, that hydrostatic force also allows for these molecules, especially uh, larger molecules, sometimes to pass through. Um, not so much the larger, m maybe more of the smaller of the, of the molecules move out of the blood by filtration. Now, you will study this in great detail in A&P2, but I wanted to give you this example of filtration. It is still passive, but this uh, glomeruli are found in the kidneys and the nephrons of the kidneys, and this is called the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole, afferent or efferent and notice how large this blood vessel is. And then this one's smaller, okay? So have you ever uh, had to do plumbing at your house? The supply line that brings water to your house may be an inch and a half or two inches, but by the time it gets to your bathroom, to your shower, that pipe may be only a half inch and so the purpose of the two inch is, and then it, the water is, um, there are different branches coming off of that two inch pipe. It is two inches, so when you uh, branch off so many times and it goes into smaller pipes each time it branches off, it's to keep the pressure up so that you'll have water pressure. Well, in your kidneys, these glomerular capsules are found in this, uh, here's your blood coming into this glomerular capsule, and this is a large vessel. So you have hydrostatic pressure, and that hydrostatic pressure is going to push out electrolytes and uh, calcium and sodium and potassium and some water and other things. And this is working off hydrostatic pressure. Now, at the same time, you have the pressure going this way, but then you have solids in here that are too big to be filtered out. So now 
because you have solids or solutes here and less out here, you're going to have some osmotic pressure. It's called blood colloid osmotic pressure. What's a colloid? The solutes are the colloids. So you're going to have some things filtering back in by osmosis, some water coming back in, because you don't need to lose all your water here. So you're going to have some water coming back in by uh, os with osmotic pressure. And then you have pressure of things being pushed out and into this glomerular capsule. And so because there's pressure here now, you're going to have capsulary hydrostatic pressure pushing some, some of the things back in. So, um, but all of this to say filtration happens because of hydrostatic pressure. And when you have a larger vessel coming in and a smaller vessel coming out, this is going to increase the pressure and push push stuff uh, materials out just an example of filtration in your body we're going to stop here and start with active transport next time